August 4th, 2007. It's around 1.30 a.m. in Alaska. And 52-year-old Mindy Schloss, a psychiatric nurse practitioner, is planning her Saturday. A relative newcomer to Anchorage, Mindy's day includes errands and lunch with a friend. Before going to bed, she sends a few emails, then logs off for the night. Saturday when I called her, there was no answer. And then on Sunday, her cell phone was full, not taking messages, and that was not like Mindy. Jerry Yet has been best friends with Mindy for 18 years and knows everything about her, including her favorite pastime. Mindy had a Jones for picking blueberries, <laughs> that's all I can say. It was uh, something she was obsessed with, and that was a very common present you would get from Mindy jams or cheesecakes with blueberries in them, bunt cakes with blueberries in them. Jerry often goes to Mindy's house to take care of her cat while Mindy's away. This Monday, something is off. When I got there, the door handle on the door seemed a little loose, but it was locked. There were bills that were half made on the table. There was an empty wine bottle sitting in the kitchen, and it just looked different. And so I called her supervisor and said I hadn't been able to contact Hi, Mindy, Mark. and she said, well, she didn't show up for work this morning. Okay, thanks. Mindy commutes 360 miles to her job in Fairbanks every other week and almost never misses work. Concerned, Mindy's boss calls the Anchorage police to report that she might be missing. Anchorage police? For her to not show up when she had patients scheduled, she would never do that. Police immediately do a routine check of Mindy's house, looking for anything suspicious. But there are no signs of forced entry. Then, Mindy misses work again on Tuesday. Her boss makes another call to Anchorage police. I was on my way home one night and the sergeant of our unit called and uh, said that we had a suspicious missing person and asked if I could come back in and work on the case. Detective Pam Pernu has worked homicide for the last five years and knows something's amiss. She was a very responsible, reliable uh, person that um, took commitment very seriously and had never been out of contact for this long. Detective Pernu begins the investigation back at Mindy's house. Jerry Yet, Mindy's really good friend, showed up and we talked inside the house for a while and uh, she told me the things that seemed out of place to her. Came in here, but, uh, she never leave her Jerry points out. out a few peculiar things. I made her a special custom-made apron and it was all of her I favorite guess. colors and it had moons and stars and I had given her, her that for her birthday and the apron was wadded up in the garbage and I said, Mindy didn't put that there. She would never throw it away. There's something I'll show you in a bit. I noticed the, the garage was empty, and uh, one of the things that Jerry said was that her car should be in the garage. It was uncharacteristic of Mindy to drive her car to the airport or, or anything like that. Jerry wants to believe that her friend is okay. Maybe she'd gone out Sunday berry picking or doing something, and something physically had happened. But a check of Mindy's airline records reveals that she never even boarded the plane. Detective Pernu is certain that something sinister has taken place. Something had happened to her. I didn't know what had happened to her, but I didn't think she was coming home.
Detective Pernu combs through Mindy's bank records. You just kind of can look at someone's bank information and figure out if, if things are normal in their life at that point or if things are unusual and something's wrong. She notices suspicious activity on Mindy's statements. Two $500 ATM withdrawals from two different banks the day after Mindy disappeared. They said that it was unusual for her to withdraw cash and the cash withdrawals were in the early morning hours. Detective Pernu reviews surveillance footage from the Wells Fargo and Credit Union One banks taken in the early hours of the morning. What she sees next confirms that it wasn't Mindy taking out the cash. And it was a white male and he had a bandana pulled up um, just under his eyes and he had a hat on, a baseball cap on. It looked like he was trying to disguise who he was. Detective Pernu is now certain Mindy is in danger. She needs help fast and knows the most relentless investigators of murder and money are the FBI. She contacts Special Agent Mike Thorson. He hits the ground running, starting with the only lead, the bank videos. Uh, the first time I took a look at that video coverage from the Wells Fargo Bank, I knew that something had happened to Mindy. Agent Thorson analyzes footage of the first transaction at Wells Fargo. From the left, you can see a white male standing outside, appears to be doing something, walks into the bank, walks straight up to the ATM machine. You can see he's wearing a bandana, wearing a blue puffy style jacket, backpack, and you just saw that he pulled down the bandana, revealing his mouth and his nose. He's conducting a balance inquiry into the account. The ATM then displays that that account has approximately $20,000 in it. That same man leaves and returns to the ATM four times. Agent Thorson deduces that Mindy's card had become trapped in the machine. My belief was that he was trying everything that he could to get that ATM card back because he knew there was $20,000 sitting in a bank account that he just lost his access to. Agent Thorson fast forwards through the video and gets a break. A possible witness at the Credit Union One. We saw a person going into the bank that was not wearing a disguise, walked in the bank, performed his, his transaction, received his money, and then exited the bank. Agent Thorson begins trying to identify the witness. But it's going to take time to track him down. And with so little to go on, Mindy's time may be running out. I think I knew at the time she disappeared. My heart said there's not going to be a good outcome. Special Agent Jolene Godin is questioning everyone who has crossed Mindy's path. We were looking at family, we were looking at friends, we were looking at any, basically anybody who knew her that would have had access to her that day, would have had a motive to, to do something to her. Mindy's boyfriend is questioned, but is able to prove he was in another city the night she disappeared. Investigators also learn that Mindy was getting bids from contractors to do work on her home. She had some home repair, remodeling type things that she was um, in the process of, of getting started on. One worker was the last person to see Mindy in her home before she disappeared. Another worker turns out to have a criminal record. Could one of the workers have killed Mindy and stolen her debit card? Before long, 
A friend spots what could be Mindy's red Acura Integra near a cargo facility at Anchorage International Airport. Just driving down the street, happened to look over, pulled in, compared to license plates, and sure enough, it turned out to be Mindy's car. FBI agent Mike Thorson and his team think they're onto something when they find surveillance video of the parking lot. We we're able to see Mindy Sloss's red Acura come into view, park in a stall, and see what appears to be a male wearing a backpack exit the vehicle and then walk outside a view of the camera. But they can't identify the man because he's too far away from the surveillance camera. Their frustration grows. When we see the video footage, you have another potential lead that ends up going really nowhere. Without a positive ID, investigators pin their hopes on finding a clue inside Mindy's car. We found uh, inside the car, uh, Mindy Sloss's purse, house keys, car keys, a wallet, everything except for her ATM card. They also gather forensic evidence, which they hope will tell them who was driving Mindy's car. They lifted, tried to lift fingerprints, they swabbed for DNA and did a number of things with the car and they were actually able to get a couple of, of swabs off the steering wheel that were sent to the state crime lab. But the results will take weeks. And the FBI doesn't have that kind of time. Special Agent Jolene Godin reaches out to Washington, D.C. We contacted our evidence response team unit out of headquarters and then asked them if they would deploy the human scent dogs as well as cadaver dogs out to Anchorage to assist. Supervisory Special Agent Rex Stockham helped create the Bureau's forensic canine program in 1999. He makes the decision to assist the Anchorage unit in their search for Mindy. The decision to bring five dogs uh, uh, was, was pretty simple for us. Uh, we had a lot of uh, square miles, if you will, to cover, uh, both looking for the body and looking for the offender. As the FBI readies its dogs, Anchorage PD canvasses Mindy's neighborhood. Detective Pam Pernu goes door to door, asking residents if they've seen anything unusual. They all mention Mindy's next door neighbors. Every single house pointed to this house, saying that this house had a lot of young people that were living in it, that it was loud, there were parties, uh, people coming and going at all hours of the night. They didn't have a good accounting for who actually lived there and who didn't. When investigators finally do speak to residents of that house, they can't get a straight answer. They'd just be very evasive about who all lived in the house, how many people lived there, anything having to do with who was in that house. Why are they hiding something? What is it, what's going on that they're not willing to really talk about who's there? Kathy Easley lives next door to the home in question. This is my house. I lived here when all this was going on. But before detectives can speak to her, a neighbor knocks on her door. A guy from next door named Josh came over. I came to the door and sort of had it half open. Hey, um, I live next door, of course, you know. I've seen you around. Uh, I have a question. Has anybody seen, seen uh, come to you looking for me or anything? Anybody's been because over? Because if anybody... He said, hey, you know, I, I don't want anybody to know that I'm living next door. And I said, why? And he goes, well, I have a warrant out for my arrest. You know, I really can't he said, well, nobody knows that I'm there, and the police, I think, are in the neighborhood. And I said, well, I haven't talked to anybody, because at that point, I hadn't spoken to anyone yet, and nobody had been to my door. The neighbor leaves. And minutes later, Detective Pernu shows up. But Kathy's too scared to talk. Hi. I'm not I stepped out on my porch. And I'm just checking in with the neighbors. And looked over. 
and he's looking out the window watching me talk to the police. So I made some pretty big hand gestures to them that I didn't know anything about it. I don't know anything And just shook my head a few times so that it, I knew he would see that. Well, if you do notice anything out of the ordinary, do me a favor and give me a call. Okay. Thank you so Thank much you. for your time. Later, Kathy calls Detective Pernu and leaves a cryptic message. She says she doesn't want to be interviewed at home because she's afraid of her neighbor. Turns out, she has good reason to worry. He's watching her every move. You could hear when somebody walked up on the porch. So I kind of walked through to see who was on the porch. Um, Josh from next door was standing there and um, I kind of watched and he just stood there on my porch for a couple of minutes and I, he didn't knock again. He didn't do anything. You know, he just kind of stood there. Detective Pernu assigned surveillance to the house. Eventually, she gets a full name. 27-year-old Joshua Wade. Investigators suspect that if Wade doesn't have anything to do with Mindy's disappearance, he might know who does. August 16th. It's now been 12 days since Mindy disappeared, and the chances of finding her alive are dwindling. The FBI's forensic canine team arrives in Anchorage. They start at the Wells Fargo Bank, where agents present the dogs with scents taken from Mindy's car. They immediately get a positive response. A positive response by our canines means there's an association between the collected odor and an odor uh, on the ground uh, near the ATM machine. The dog was indicating to us there's, there's an odor matching what you're having me smell present here. I'm gonna go follow it. A bloodhound drops down and starts running the trail to the source. It leads them straight to Mindy's neighborhood. You come to Mindy's house before you come to Josh's house, and the dog uh, kind of went up to Mindy's house a little bit and sniffed around and then went to the fence that separates the two houses. The dog's nose went up in the air, and then the dog went down the fence line and around the fence and up the front yard of, of Josh Wade's house and then went to the side door. Agent Godin is watching the dogs closely. To her surprise, a second bloodhound also makes a beeline straight to Joshua Wade's house. I thought it was going to be helpful, but I had no idea that this was going to happen, and so um, I was pretty excited. Investigators are now suspicious that Joshua Wade knows what happened to Mindy. And they get even more curious when they look into Wade's past and learn that this isn't his first brush with the law. August 12, 2007. It's been nearly two weeks since anyone has heard from 52-year-old Mindy Schloss, and hopes are dwindling that she's still alive. We knew that something had happened to her. We just didn't know if it was an accident or if somebody had, somebody had hurt her. Agents refocused their investigation, going back to Mindy's friends and construction workers people they had previously questioned. None of the leads pan out. We ruled out the roommates. We were able to rule out the contractors that had recently been at Mindy's house. We were able to rule out Mindy's close friends. But there is one person of interest, 27-year-old Joshua Wade, that they don't rule out. Especially when they learn he's been linked to another missing woman. Seven years before Mindy's disappearance, a 33-year-old native Alaskan woman named Della Brown vanishes. She was a very outgoing person, a very likable, I mean, 
Uh, she could strike up a small talk with just about anybody. That's just the type of person she was. Della was raised by her grandparents. She struggles with drugs and alcohol, but still manages to hold down a job as a bingo hostess. She was just real outgoing. And if you looked at her direction, can I get you guys anything else? She always smiled back. She had a forever smile. Thanks. On September 2nd, 2000, Della's body is discovered in an abandoned shack in a rough part of Anchorage. The shack is known around town for drug use, gambling, prostitution, and tonight, murder. Somebody could be back there by that shed for quite some time and nobody would ever notice. If you're just passing through the area, you wouldn't even think that anything was going on back there. Officer Tim Landis of Anchorage PD is the lead detective on the case. She was lying on her back and uh, she'd obviously had a significant amount of trauma about her head and face. Della is beaten so severely that her head is partially caved in, and it appears that she's been raped. It was believed that she had been beaten to death with possibly a rock, and as you can see in the area, uh, there's lots of rocks in the area, and it's quite possible that any of these rocks in the area might have been used. Della's mother, Daisy Piggott, is spared the gruesome details. He was awful. Nobody wants to hear that kind of news anyway. But we didn't have a lot of information other than she was killed. But I didn't know the contents of how badly she was beaten. because they kept that from me. With no murder weapon or clear leads, detectives have little to go on. We actually had a spate of homicides that were kind of outdoor uh, deaths. Detective Dave Parker is concerned a serial killer may be on the loose. There are about uh, five or six, and we didn't know if it was a single person doing this or whether it was multiple incidents, and they just happened all at the same time. Detectives soon learned that Della's boyfriend had been arrested before for beating her in the past. At first, he's a prime suspect. When we initially found her, everyone is a suspect, I guess. But after a while, we determined that he more than likely was not involved. Detectives have little to go on and scramble to keep the case from going cold. It was very frustrating because uh, he just we were investigating all the leads that we could find, and it just seemed like they led nowhere. Until they get a surprising tip. We received a tip that indicated a person had seen the body prior to it being reported to police, and that this person that had seen the body had been taken there by the subject that had killed Della. A group of informants claim a 20-year-old named Joshua Wade saw Della passed out on the side of the road hours before she was murdered. They say he later killed Della in cold blood, then took them to see the body. Josh showed up and he was excited, was sweating, 
had what appeared to be blood on the front of his hooded sweatshirt. And at some point during that time, Josh was saying, hey, come over here, I want to show you something. And took him to the shed and showed him the body. This? Yeah. On September 30th, nearly a month after Della Brown's body was found, police arrest Wade and charge him with sexual assault, murder, and evidence tampering. At trial, Della's mother sits front and center. Like everyone else, she's confident there will be a conviction. Every time he went to court, I went to court. Even if that hearing lasted for 10 minutes, I still went to court. Wade's attorney argues that Joshua stumbled onto Della's body and was just trying to impress some tough friends by taking credit for the murder. But the unthinkable happens. Joshua is acquitted on all charges except for tampering with a shovel that was evidence. The case was kind of a perfect storm of events. We didn't have any witnesses to the actual killing of Della. The informants had a pretty rough past. And by the time we went to trial, they were facing charges themselves. And you combine all those things and it, it made for a very difficult case. After deliberating for several days, the jury returns a verdict. Police and family are convinced Wade has gotten away with murder. Once they read the verdict of not guilty, absolutely felt sick to my stomach. When he was acquitted, it was a real dark day for me. At his hearing, Wade mocks the Anchorage PD. And the only person I'm sorry to is her mother. That's it. Wade serves a little more than three years and is released on December 12th, 2006. Now, less than a year later, Joshua Wade is being linked to the murder of another woman. Is he the man who used Mindy's card at the ATM? And will the mysterious witness be able to identify him? FBI agents can't help but wonder. He definitely became someone that we had to focus some attention on and we had to look at. A year after his release from prison for evidence tampering in the murder of Della Brown, the FBI is now questioning Joshua Wade's role in the disappearance of Mindy Schloss. Even though he did have some past uh, history in the state of Alaska with uh, his acquittal on the, the brutal murder of Della Brown, we still could not specifically target Joshua Wade because we had no idea whether he was involved or not. For weeks, Special Agents Mike Thorson and Jolene Godin have searched for a witness they saw on the Credit Union 1 ATM footage. They hope the witness will give them the break they need and identify the man using Mindy's ATM card. They finally track him down. And we interviewed him approximately a week to two weeks later. He says, absolutely, I saw, I saw that guy. And then he goes and says, I, I can't describe him for you. It was four o'clock in the morning. It was dark. And a potential lead that we thought we might have turned out we didn't have anything. But FBI scent dogs have confirmed the connection between Mindy's car and Joshua Wade's house. And the evidence is starting to point in one direction. And the agents aren't the only ones becoming suspicious of Wade. Tina Greaser, whose 20-year-old daughter Christina is friends with Joshua, has her doubts. My daughter was hanging out with him quite a bit at that time, giving him rides, taking him places, um, sharing everything with me, because of course I was really concerned at the point, you know, I was like telling her things, his behavior was really weird. Two weeks after Mindy's disappearance, Wade asks Christina for a ride home. As they pull up, they see police swarming the house. Wade tells Christina not to stop, which only adds to her suspicions. 
Inside Wade's house, the FBI and Anchorage police execute a search warrant. They make some startling discoveries. Take a look at this. We found a jacket, and it was the same jacket on the ATM video. Um, and inside the pocket of that jacket was an ATM receipt showing a withdrawal from Mindy Schloss's account. Investigators also find a woman's watch. That gold watch was further identified by a close friend of Mindy's as more than likely being Mindy's. Percent credit shoes. Scent samples taken directly from Wade's belongings yeah, confirm good. suspicions. We collected scent out of Josh Wade's shoes in his closet, and also we obtained scent from the jacket, and we used that scent to kind of narrow it down to Josh Wade. Agents are more confident than ever that Wade is an extreme danger to society. We actually had a connection between the car and the ATM in the house, and so Josh Wade, if he didn't do it, he at least knew something about it or was connected somehow. Agents scramble to put Wade behind bars as quickly as possible. With no body, they still don't have enough evidence to bring murder charges against him. But they do have enough to pursue bank fraud and aggravated identity theft charges. Aggravated identity theft had a two-year mandatory minimum sentence. And what that is, you're using Mindy Sloss's ATM card in a manner that uh, involved violence. Two years should buy agents enough time to find Mindy, who is now presumed dead, and to build an airtight murder case. But first, they have to locate Joshua Wade. Unfortunately, there's a catch. He's gone into hiding. On August 29, 2007, more than three weeks after Mindy vanished, a federal arrest warrant is issued for Wade, and the biggest manhunt in Anchorage history gets underway. Trying to find Joshua Wade turned out to be a, a, a difficult task. APD and FBI hit the streets, tried to find him almost on a daily basis, discovered that, that we were minutes, hours behind where he had just been. Wade's father, Greg, is overwhelmed. I wanted so much to believe I may have been wrong and he may not have committed the first homicide. And then here another woman ends up missing that's had contact with my son. I was just devastated. He makes a public appeal to his son. I love him. I love you, Josh. I want you to turn yourself in. So Wade's friend, Christina Greaser, has been following news coverage of Mindy's disappearance. She's horrified when she sees the ATM surveillance footage. My daughter had pointed out, she goes, oh my God, looks like he's wearing a backpack. And she was like, oh my God, I gave him a ride today and he left his backpack in my car. They rush out to the car and look inside Wade's bag. In the backpack, there was a half a bottle of alcohol. Um, he had like a wallet that had his old prison ID card, um, a lot of bank receipts. There was also a cell phone in there that had pictures of a gun on it. Looks like a gun. Christina calls the police and tells them everything she knows. To her surprise, Joshua Wade shows up at her East Anchorage apartment within hours. Christina is standing face to face with a suspected killer, and she's terrified. Josh wanted my daughter to give him a ride out to Wasilla. He said he had something to take care of out in Wasilla and to pick up uh, some CDs and other personal belongings that he owned at the time. But my daughter refused. Josh, I can't, okay? I need your ride. At that point, she made the excuse to go into the apartment for a cigarette. When she made her phone calls, words ensued with both of them, and he got angry and ended up uh, leaving. Christina calls Anchorage police just as Wade flees to a nearby apartment. She was following him on foot with her cell phone. 
giving updates to the SWAT team members as to where he was. Hey! He knocks on the door of an apartment and asks to use the phone, then pushes his way in. Hey, what are you doing? Sit down! Dude, hey, sit down! Don't even mess with me now. There were a brother and sister that lived in the apartment, and he eventually let the brother leave, and the sister stayed in the apartment. When a policeman knocks on the door, Wade tells officers to stand back and that he has a hostage. Joshua Wade at that point was considered armed and dangerous, but law enforcement, Acres Police, along with ourselves, had no idea whether he was armed or not. Every on-duty Anchorage police officer, FBI agent, SWAT member, and canine unit stands at the ready, guns drawn, prepared to fire. I was thinking they're finally going to get him. Well, this is it. They've got him. On the morning of September 2nd, 2007, residents of a sleepy East Anchorage apartment complex awake to SWAT teams banging on their doors. Suspected murderer Joshua Wade has taken a woman hostage inside an apartment, and the standoff between him and the FBI has shut down the neighborhood. This whole road was blocked off. No traffic was allowed through. Authorities wait anxiously as a negotiator tries to convince Wade to give himself up. Police Department, what? Open the door. Well, he's relieved that we found him. Now you're waiting until such time that he actually gets in handcuffs and he gets in the car. Your job's still not over. Wade has already gotten away with one murder. Now he has to decide whether to turn himself in and risk being convicted. What do you want? Or risk being shot during a standoff. Yeah. At 11.40 a.m., Wade decides to surrender no, fine, fine. and let his hostage go. I was relieved, and one of the undercover FBI agents that we had dealt with, he came up towards us and everything and gave us a hug, and I was finally like, we can sleep at night. Officers cuff Wade and take him to FBI headquarters for questioning. Agent Thorson needs a confession if he has any hope of getting justice for Mindy. But he takes an unusual tact. I explained that we had charged him with bank fraud and explained that bank fraud he had used the ATM card of another individual without that person's permission. Wade looks at him incredulously. No, you're assuming that. You guys assume this? You guys assume all this? No, we don't assume. We have a little bit more than assume. I mean, we actually talked to Mindy, you know. Hmm? What'd you just say? We said we talked to Mindy. Are you guys trying to play games with me, man? I stated we had spoke with Mindy Sloss which was not true. We had not spoke with her. <laughs> he almost smiled and smirked. That's when he said, you're, you both with me. Agent Thorson, he's certain Wade knows exactly what happened to Mindy. When he smirked and smiled, to me, she, she was dead. Joshua Wade is transferred to the Anchorage jail. On September 11, 2007, he is indicted on fraud charges. It's now been more than a month since Mindy Schloss disappeared. Without a body, agents can't build a murder case against Joshua Wade. Then, on September 13th, a workman reports a gruesome discovery about an hour north of Anchorage. He got out of his truck, walked back in the woods, saw something that didn't look right to him, walked up and saw that it was what appeared to be a human body. Investigators race to the scene. The body has been burned, 
but appears to be female. Investigators carefully search the area and find a bullet and a shell casing. Dental analysis soon confirms that the body is, in fact, 52-year-old Mindy Schloss. Once they found her body, you couldn't really put yourself in a denial position anymore. It was really hard because it was a confirmation of everything you knew in your heart. While Mindy's friends grieve, agents begin building an airtight case against Joshua Wade. Now we had new evidence and new leads to follow. It was definitely big for the case to find her body. Scent dogs confirmed that Wade had been at the location where Mindy's body was discovered. Agents also take DNA samples from Mindy and swab the wheel of Mindy's car, which they presume was driven by Wade. Those DNA swabs that were then turned in to the state of Alaska crime lab, and the crime lab then came back with DNA matching Joshua Wade. The match puts Wade at the scene of the crime, and this time, there's no getting away with it. Wade is indicted on eight counts, including murder, carjacking, and aggravated identity theft. He vehemently denies it, even to his father. I said, if you did this, I want you to face up to it. I want you to tell the truth. And he sat right there and looked me in the eyes and told me he did not do it. But it's not long before Wade realizes he's backed into a corner. Rather than risk going to trial and losing, he pleads guilty and admits to torturing and killing Mindy Schloss. He tells investigators a chilling story. In the early morning hours of August 4th, Wade broke into Mindy's home with the intent to commit burglary. Once inside, he bound her hands and legs with black zip ties, then gagged her with a rag and wrapped the tape around her head. You start thinking about the horrifying emotional fear and trauma and terror that she went through. I mean, that's, that's heinous. You know, that's, that's not human to do that to somebody else. Then, he forced Mindy to give up her debit card PIN number and shoved her into the back seat of her car. And eventually drove her to Wasilla, approximately 50 some miles, about an hour's drive. Mindy lay helpless in the back seat. I cannot imagine that whole car ride must have just been terrifying. Wade pulled into an undeveloped subdivision and parked the car in a wooded cul-de-sac. He made her get out of the car, walk down the path. He shot her in the back of the head. Wade returned to Mindy's home and tried to conceal his crime. He made her bed, he stole her watch, and dumped her car at the airport. In the days after the murder, he withdrew cash from Mindy's accounts, then returned to the woods to burn Mindy's body. I think he had an innate anger and a viciousness, and the demons would come out and he could not control that anger and hatred towards other people, and especially towards women. After admitting to Mindy's murder, Wade strikes a deal with prosecutors. If he also confesses to Della Brown's murder, he will be spared the death penalty for his crimes. Now everybody was gonna know who killed Della. I always knew in my heart who killed Della, but he was going to admit it. I mean, I could have almost walked on air that day. The fact that Wade killed two people uh, doesn't necessarily make him a serial killer. Anger. Personal gain. Control. Power. Uh, 
these were all elements of, of Joshua Wade's motivations and the crimes that he committed, uh, in particular the homicides of Della Brown and Minnie Schloss. At his sentencing hearing, Wade reads an 11-minute statement. And friends, I'm kind of glad I got caught. And did you murder Della Brown, Mr. Wade? I am admitting to the murder and the murder alone of Della Brown, Your Honor. Wade is sentenced to 99 years in prison without parole for the murder of Mindy Schloss. You, you want someone to admit they're wrong, but it didn't bring Mindy back, and it didn't bring Della back. Um.